How do we fulfill the Great Commission? In fact, actually, first of all, let's look at what the Great Commission is and give ourselves a little reminder. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 28. I'm going to draw from two passages today. This is one of them and connect you to another passage as well. And in this passage, we see the Great Commission, the last few words of Jesus here on earth, uh, and giving us a purpose. And how do we tie that into our lives? How do we bring that and make that a reality and apply it in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis? So let's read from verse um, 16 down. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountains which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Jesus said, Go, therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptize them, teach them to observe the commandments, preach the gospel of the kingdom. You know, a few weeks ago I talked about loving the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind. The observing and imp implying, implementing the commandments into your life. And, the, and lo, I am with you always. See, everything we do, everything we are, everything we live, why we work, everything about us, what we think, what we speak, what we say, how we behave, how we act, everything should in some direct or indirect way point to this. By this I mean the Great Commission. Whether it's direct or indirect, it should point to this. This should be our purpose. This should be our primary purpose. We do have other purposes and other things that we do in life. We have our jobs, we raise our family, we, we build community. But this is the primary purpose, or should be the primary purpose of your and my life. This is what we live for. Many of us are blessed in many, many different ways. Well, if you are blessed in different ways, you are blessed so that you can be a blessing to others. And what do I mean by that? Um, you know, if you are blessed with a magnetic personality, an outgoing personality, it's upon you maybe to bring others together, to build community, relationships, to uplift others, those who are downtrodden, those who don't have friends, those who need a helping, supporting hand or just words of comfort. If you are gifted musically or you can sing, you can be a blessing in the church, you can be a blessing in your home with your family, bringing music and joy to the house, all for the glory of God. If you are blessed financially, you can give to the poor, you can seek those in need. And by, what I mean by that is not just out of your abundance, not just out of the extra, but sometimes for us, it's so easy for us to give out of our extra and abundance, but so difficult for us to give sacrificially, not just financially, but in time. When I have time, I do all the good deeds, but when I don't have, when, when, when there's some other thing in my life or a priority in my life or that I deem a priority, I discard these things of the kingdom, what Jesus calls us to do. See, there are many ways for us to fulfill our purpose and how God wants us to do it. And today I want to talk to you about one of the main ways in which we can get ourselves into a position to fulfill the Great Commission through our lives or through the way that God wants to do it through our lives. What makes your heart beat? What makes your heart beat? I don't mean the physical, actu the actual physical science of it. The spiritual, emotional science of what truly makes your heart beat. What gets you up in the morning and excited for the day? 
What is the purpose and what stirs your heart for your daily, weekly, monthly, even ministry? What makes you wake up in the morning with a purpose in your life? If you have no purpose, if you and I have no purpose, we will struggle, we will have no joy. We might have things to do, but we will consistently experience a sense of emptiness, shallowness. There are times in life when we will actually find things to fill those gaps, but then when that is over, there's this emptiness and shallowness in life. Where am I headed in life? What am I doing? Why am I here? You know, the professional with the highest degree or degrees who has achieved the highest level in his job or in his profession, all the honors that he could possibly get, he or her herself might find many a time that that is not what brings happiness or content in life. And we've heard this over and over again. This is a reminder to us. And then there are others who may not have achieved the highest level, who don't have, an, who don't have a degree per se as the uh, world recognizes it. Has maybe achieved a little bit, would be considered a middle of the road achiever in their profession. But yet they're happy and content in the place that they are at because they have found purpose in life. A lot of us are living, we're walking around, but are you alive? A lot of us are living, but we're dead inside. There are many who are dead who are alive right now. You know what I mean? There are many physically dead, but who are alive right now. And there are many who are physically living right now, but who are dead. God wants each and every one of us to be alive. He doesn't want us to just, it's not his plan and his design for us to just go through every single day, through the motions. You know, I also used to say this, so I'm guilty of it. When someone asks, how are you doing? I say, surviving. Surviving. I see many of you laughing, so you've used that too. But God wants us to not just go through the motions. He wants us to live with a purpose. And I believe that one of the best ways for us to do that is if we fine-tune our hearts and our heartbeat to try to beat as close to the heartbeat of God as possible. Thank you. What stirs the heart of God? What motivated Jesus here on earth? Jesus was not asking the disciples and is not asking you today to do something that he wasn't willing to do. See, it says here, he, he says, go therefore and make disciples. Did Jesus do that? He went from city to village to town, making disciples, teaching, observing the commandments, preaching the gospel, healing. He sacrificed. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for that sacrifice. Amen. He had his eyes on the will of the Father, and the purpose of his life here on earth. And with that, I want to bring us to Matthew chapter 9. If you'll turn with me. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness, every disease among the people. Aha! And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching, preaching, healing. Do 
This was Jesus' life. That's what he was here to do. And that is what he's calling you and I to do. Get out of our seats. Get out of our comfort zone. And go. Go out. Walk the streets. Heal. Teach. Uh, preach the gospel of the kingdom. You know, we, we see here, when we look back in the two chapters leading up to this, even or before that, but if you want to even just start at chapter 8, Jesus cleanses the leper. He heals the centurion's uh, servant. Many other healings. He teaches on the cost, uh, cost of the gospel, uh, sorry, cost of discipleship. The power that he has in him is shown uh, when even the wind and the waves obey him. Demon possessed people are released. Oh, and then Jesus forgives. He builds faith. He brings Matthew. As a disciple, we are in chapter 9 here. He's questioned about fasting, he's teaching. Healings take place. A blind man can see, the dumb can speak. Oh, wow, glory to Jesus. The amount just captured in these chapters, I can just imagine people walking with him from city to town, the electricity in the air, the adrenaline rush. Can you just, just picture it in your mind, going from place to place and you just see what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? I just saw a, a man who hasn't walked get up and walk. I saw someone who was as far as I could ever imagine turn around and drop everything and come follow Jesus. It would have been exciting and, and, and there would have been um, energy in that environment and the atmosphere around him. And yet, the disciples and everyone around him would have experienced this unbelievable power and atmosphere. And then we get to verse 36 and we see, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. You know, last week, Pastor Aisha described and referenced the sheep um, and how the sheep follow the voice of the shepherd and if there is no voice, how lost they are. If you didn't remember, quick reminder to you. But here we truly see the heart of Jesus. All these things are happening around the power of God is flowing through him. Healings are happening. And as the son of God, he's, he's uh, implementing the will of God in his life, uh, the fa father God in his life, and, but yet he also has a massive heart of compassion. That is actually why he was willing to sacrifice himself for you and I. To that immense degree, he loved me so much. Thank you, Jesus, again. Thank you, Jesus. So as we look at verse 36 here again, where he says, the, he saw the multitudes and he was moved with compassion. I was reminded of a story. It's a true story in my life. And some of you may have heard this example in one way or the other because uh, it's something I have shared to several different audiences. But in my, in my time 15 years ago working for the American Red Cross, we dealt with a lot of... Um, disaster relief and emergency management uh, things when we were we, we, we had people coming back from war zones from the Middle East and alongside the uh, uh, emergency management government institutions here we were to provide them food clothing and shelter and support them in different areas then uh, there were those who experienced a house fire in their home, everything burned to the ground and, and, and they run out of the house and they have nothing with them. And then we, have, we had communities that uh, got flooded and we know how, how that is sometimes. We have uh, monsoon rains that come through and ravage communities where people uh, are, are basically thrown out of their houses. And, 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 and the organization was... Um, there, as soon as the fire department got a call or the emergency management got a call for a disaster, then we were the second call and we were there. And we were an organization that was um, 75 to 90 percent of our active manpower was volunteers. 
The staff made up a small portion. Actually, in most of our branches, it was way more than 90%. It was like 95, 98% were volunteers. And I got to meet a lot of people from varying backgrounds because our volunteers were, we had doctors, we had pastors, we had chefs, we had um, uh, uh, security personnel, you name it. If you made yourself available, you were qualified. Now, we would, we would channel you into the right area based on your experience and train you and get you up to speed so that when things happened, you were ready with the right protocol, but the, the qualification was being willing to help and being available. And I met this one volunteer who was one of our all-stars. We had many of them, and one of our all-stars, her name was Ginny, and I felt like almost any time there was a disaster in her area or her neighborhood, she was on the ground, she was there. And of course, when there were much larger ones that uh, meant we crossed state lines or went to a different part of a country, she gave her time for that as well. And so we, we, I had to work on one relief project with her uh, near a river community. It had been flooding or raining a lot up north and this river got uh, overflowed and it came down, uh, down south and the river banks overflowed to as high as 20, 30 feet. And you're talking about entire communities in that area where after the water had receded, you'd walk into a house and you, like this line you see up here, you can see the water line so you know that everything below it was underwater just destroyed. And this was a several day project and, and each day I would go meet her in the morning and I'd run down the list of the volunteers that are coming today to support us. And, and on one particular day, when I said this name, she said, oh, let's just say his name is John Joseph or something like that. And when I said John, she was like, oh, what, what did you say? And then I told the name again and she was like, oh. And I, I said, Ginny, what do you mean by oh? No, no, you'll see. I said, no, no, I need to know. She said, no, no, you'll see. She didn't want to jade my perspective on it. But as I, I, I met this guy, John, and we worked through the day, and I realized he was kind of very matter of fact, just you know, uh, doing what he had to do. But he kept looking at his watch. And, um, and then at 3 o'clock, sharp 3 o'clock, he took the volunteer vest that we gave them. He took it off, and he put it down, and he said, OK, my time's up. He grabs a water bottle and he starts to walk out. And I said, John, John, do you have anywhere to go or anything to do? Because the team is here. We have uh, another three, four hours of sunlight. We have about 30, 40 families more that we can hit through the course of the day and support them and try to work with them. And he said, no, no, I'm good. I said, I know you're good, but I'm just wondering if you can hang out a little bit and help us. He said, no, no, I'm good. I said, you have somewhere to go? He said, no, I'm just going to go home and relax. I've done my good deed for the day. In that moment, I knew what Ginny meant by, oh. John had shown up just to do his good deed for the day. His heart wasn't in it. Ginny was a lady because full of love and compassion and care for those around her and who she was willing to help. John was ticking a box. Ginny's heart was beating for those people. See, when my heart is moved with compassion, and move with the things of God, time doesn't become a factor. A lot of times you will find that your energy rarely goes down. Depression doesn't set in. And most of all, you probably will not get distracted. See, Jesus had done a lot in, this past, in these chapters leading up to it, but he wasn't distracted. His heart was moved with compassion. Where is my heart this morning? What is compassion? Compassion, if I can uh, 
quickly reference what, what the definition says, sympathetic pity and concern for the suffering or misfortune of others. And in the original text, it actually states the greatest form of pity. That's the compassion that Jesus had. Do I see the world around me? Do I see the people that are weary and scattered and lost? Or do I see success and material development and translate that to happiness and fulfillment in life? Further to this, I wonder, do I take responsibility? I'm hitting home here a little bit. Do I take responsibility for the state, the spiritual state of the people around me? Do I see it as my place, my purpose in life? The people I encounter that are scattered and lost without a shepherd. Do I see it as my responsibility or my purpose to try and provide some kind of direction or let Jesus flow through me and take them to the foot of the cross? Show them the good shepherd. You know, a, a thought came upon me and I hope I can illustrate this well. Is, you know, when we, 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 we're seeing a lot of people standing at traffic lights these days when, and, and knocking on our windows. How does my heart beat in those moments? I just look for a couple of quick coins, put the window down and hand it. Or oh, am I moved and worried? I'm not telling you to stop, get out of the car and, and hold up traffic, but a good pulse is to see in that moment what's going on inside of you. Is this just like I need to get this person away from my window? Or do you hurt? Do you see the situation around you? Do these words of Jesus, do the texts that I read in the morning, the Bible study I go to, the cell groups I go to, the messages I listen to on YouTube, does it make a tangible difference in my life? Or is it just words I hear and then I move on? See, growing, do, do I have a passion for God and the things of God and the heart of God? Growing my passion, listen carefully, growing my passion for God will often or sometimes automatically grow my compassion for people and the lost. See, as I desire God more, as I run after God more, as I see the things of God more, the more I see how much the people around me need him. And this should drive me. This should be my purpose every day. To be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. Sing with me if you know. All I ask is to be like him. All through life's journey, from earth to glory. All I ask is to be like him. I'm sure it brought a tear to one or two people's eyes because I can only speak from my family perspective and what I know, but many of you who are in here will know that this was a favorite of my grandmother, Nana. For some of you, it's Auntie Sylvia. And you will remember this was a song she absolutely loved because it was what she lived. Auntie Sylvia, through her compassion, how... Her compassion for people and the lost and after all she had gone through, there's only one explanation for that. 
It's only one explanation, her undying passion for God and to know and accept the will of God and then to understand what he had done for her and how much Jesus loved her. She wanted to be like him. The heart for the lost, the heart of compassion. Then we go to verse 37. And it says here, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. And I want to pause there for a section and I, uh, for a second, and I can't help but think that each of us who call ourselves Christians, if we had a driving passion for God and our purpose was to honor and glorify Him at all times. Yes, the harvest may be plenty, but there'll be also a lot more laborers. The laborers also may be plenty. And who, oh, how many more would be reached? How many more would know that Jesus is the only way? How many more would experience the love of Christ? So remember, laborers are not just full-time workers. You and I, you and I, do we labor day in, day out for the cause, for the gospel of Jesus Christ? I started off by saying everything we are, everything we speak, everything we do. Does it point to Jesus? Does it point to the Great Commission in a direct or indirect way? I'm repeating myself, but I want to make sure this point gets home today. Or does it point to Jesus when I have the time? Does it become about God and about Jesus and about church and about ministry when I have an extra hour in the day? What if you knew, ask yourself honestly, what if you knew that today was the last day of your life? Would you live it differently? When we leave these doors, would your plans change? If I told you right now, this is the last day. Would you be going through those plans and through those motions with a purpose? Because God, the Holy Spirit is leading you and directing every path. And yes, some things will change if you knew that today was your last day. And some things will change if you were living as if today, every day is your last day. But would, be, would you be alive in every moment, in every situation, in the marketplace, in your home, in your relationships? Therefore, pray the, Lord, pray the Lord of the harvest to send our laborers into his harvest. Church, it's my message to you this morning. Are you living life as it comes? Or are you alive? What's your heart beat? Does your heart break for the things of God? You know, we sing, break my heart for what breaks yours. Does it? Because what God wants to see in your and my life is completely different to what you and I have allowed our lives to be consumed by. How much time did you spend in front of the mirror this morning? How much time did you and I spend on our phones this morning? How many things did you like or unlike? How many times on a daily basis do you check your bank balance? How many hours a day do you think about what food you're going to eat? These are all things that have to be done. <laughs> but how much of it consumes your 24 hours? And actually, if you really thought about it, it might bring you to tears. 
You know how the, you know how the phone can give you like a, uh, um, there's a setting that can show how much screen time you had? What if we had a setting in our life and at the end of the day we can see like something like a screen time or what you did for, th this is what you did for two hours, this is what you did for one hour, 45 minutes, this is what you did. How far down would we have to go to find ourselves in the Word, building others up, reaching the lost? We're not playing a game here. We're not here to play church. But trust me, this experience or this life I'm talking about, there's so much joy in it as well. That's why you're alive. Because you're walking hand in hand with the Master every moment of the day, talking to Him, consumed in His presence. You're alive! He's a good God. He blesses you and me. He loves you and me. But what He really desires from us is more than anything is to go to all nations, make disciples, Observe his commandments. Teach and preach the gospel. Have your spiritual eyes open to those who need him. To the lost. And there are many who are lost actually even in this context. You know when Jesus is talking to the Jews as well. It's because a lot of the leadership there is not providing the shepherding and the direction that was needed. And so they are like sheep that are scattered, no direction, no, no vision, no, no, no um, purpose and understanding of what the scripture meant. See, I am not on a mission here with him to help me. I'm here to fulfill his mission. And seeing through his eyes and heart will best help me accomplish the purpose which is the great commission that you and I have been called to do. Many of you have heard this. Our primary purpose is the text we just read. Our secondary purposes are our jobs, our schooling and other things. But you and I as a Christian, as a child of God, our primary purpose it's not my job. It's not my career. It's living for Him. Go to all nations. Make disciples. Teach. Preach. And for that, He has promised what? He is with us. The Holy Spirit. He is with us. He's not leaving us alone in this endeavor. Church, I want to challenge us this morning. I kept it short because I want us to reflect and pray that our hearts will start beating to the heartbeat of God. Not what I want. Not my will. But thine be done. My life is not for me, it's for you. My heart, when it sees through the eyes of Jesus, I can walk down the street, I can meet with a group of friends, and know and see without anyone talking who is hurting, who is empty. Who is, how many of you have experienced this? You know when you're, don't be, don't be shy. You know when you're in the midst of people and you're in tune with God, you can see right through. And you see the lost. And who better? Why wait for the next person? Why should you wait for him to do it? He may not meet the people in your workplace. 
Oh, someone else can handle it. I don't have the time. Oh, yeah, well, everyone says they don't have the time. Now that person has no time. And he's gone. If you are in my heart does not feel anything when someone you know well or a loved one doesn't experience the salvation of God and then passes away. If that doesn't do anything for you, if that doesn't break you in some way, you haven't understood what eternity really means. Shall we pray? just want you to take a few minutes to just ask the Lord in your own heart, Jesus, we need you right now. Holy Spirit, come and speak to us. Open eyes. Open eyes. Our spiritual eyes. Show me. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you where you have been fooling yourself to think that you are living for God, that you are implementing the Great Commission as the primary purpose in your life. Fooling yourself where you think that you have compassion for the lost and how I can change that master show me how I can change that if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now just listen carefully now just open your mouth and reach out to him and ask him ask him for his guidance ask him ask for forgiveness for allowing yourself to be fooled into thinking that you and I are living for him and living for his glory.
mountains and Jesus in the streets. of every person here every unanswered prayer for healing for deliverance for reconciliation we speak the name of Jesus over those situations there is power in that name and even as we go out Lord empower us in every area of our lives but most of all to be the light to be the salt to be who you want us to be we pray that you will prepare the hearts of people let them be receptive let them be open let your spirit work in them to hear and understand and accept the name of Jesus we love you Lord and we give our lives for your cause no other cause your cause and your cause alone in Jesus name we pray amen amen the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. The love of God the Father envelop us and wash over us this morning. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon each and every one of God's children here this morning. Now and until he comes again. Amen. God bless you and have a wonderful week.